Maybe that's where we came from originally. I mean, I've sat with Zachar I sent Zachariah Sitchin around the world. <clears throat> I think six, seven times. I sent him to Egypt. I sent him to Mazalan. I sent him to Turkey. I sent him to uh, to uh, Israel. I sent him to Egypt. I sent Zachariah to seven countries of the world. I did it personally. I sent him, and I was going to do a 13-week mini-series with Zachariah. And uh, Zachariah is sensational. I love him. But I, I, I did a contract with Zachariah where uh, my company in San Diego was going to finance a 13-week mini-series we were going to sell to PBS. And he agreed to do it. And we sent him to seven different countries. And uh, then the poor uh, mentally deranged moron that I was working with that, was, that held the checkbook decided uh, one halfway through the project that she didn't want to finance it anymore. She didn't want to do it anymore. That's it. And I had to call Zachariah and tell him, Zachariah, you're not going to believe this. You know, This woman has pulled out on us at the last minute. She's got the money, but she just decided she didn't want to do it anymore. And of course, my feeling is Zachariah Sitchin, he doesn't care. I mean, hell, I sent him around seven, seven countries of the world and sent him to all the best hotels and financed him and sent him all over the earth. Hey, if you got any other brilliant ideas, you know, give me a call. I mean, he wasn't offended. But um, <clears throat> there's all kinds of people that I have <clears throat> been in contact with for many, many years behind the scenes that I've never told anyone. And my, I mean, you know, 13, 12 years ago, 12 years ago, I, I produced a video called Matrix, <clears throat> Matrix of Power. And I got all kinds of phone calls from Hollywood stars, from all kinds of motion picture people talking, talking to me, oh man, a sensational idea of a matrix and matrix of power. And then of course, then they come out with a movie called Matrix. You know, so I've been on the cutting edge of this stuff for many years and I have, uh, uh, Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell used to get my stuff out in Santa Monica at the uh, Mandela Books. And, um, and um, some of the stuff that was in my old basic slide presentation ended up in one of the movies called Stargate. Um, I mean, I've been supplying Hollywood, and I know I've been doing it because I get phone calls from big name movie stars saying, oh, that was sensational. Well, we ought to make a movie on that. And then a year or two later, there's a movie on it. And so last time I got uh, a very important movie star called me and said, oh, man, your stuff is sensational. I love it. Uh, got all of your tapes. And I said, do you really like it that much? Oh, yes, yeah, sensational. I said, did you ever s uh, send me a check? You know, have you ever thought about cutting me a check? Oh, no, well, no, I, there's no problem. We'll do that. Yeah, I'll get around to that. No, I've never received a dime from anyone. Not even a thank you. Um, I have a question. I know that you said that you were going to talk later about, or another, at an, on another occasion, about your interpretation of the New Testament. Hopefully, I will. I well, hopefully you will, yes. Um, but what about the avatar stories from around the world? You know, the ancient um, Krishna and Rama and Osiris stories and so forth. Um, I also, years ago, heard someone talk about the incident in the New Testament in which Lazarus is described as rising and showing that the exact same story occurs in ancient Egyptian mythology where um, Bethany is Betanu and um, Lazarus, I believe, is Lazareu. I mean, it's, it's exactly the same story. The, the names are changed just ever so slightly. So there are obviously these correspondences through time and yes. different places, but what do you think about the fundamental concept of the avatar phenomenon? I think that uh, Manley P. Hall said it best. He explained that whole thing in a lecture once, where the, there seems to be a divine mandate in heaven that in all periods of darkness, when there seems to be darkness encroaching on the human family, that the spirit of the universe uh, calls out individual people <clears throat> and your spirit is moved to do something to help your fellow man to be a teacher and so there have always been teachers who have been called in, in the last and final parts of a dark time on the earth where, where the universe puts it into certain people's hearts to, to, to be like an avatar, to be like uh, a teacher 
Well, we don't have any problem talking about uh, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, any of the prophets of old and Joel and the Apostle Paul, but to bring it down into modern day, uh, now that's different. Now, if you're going to talk about God's leading you to do something, you must be an idiot. Now, Billy Graham, we understand, he's, he's being led by the Lord. Uh, you know, and go look in the, in, in, the, uh, in the Oxford Dictionary of the English Language. Look at the word Lord. L-O-R-D comes from L-A-R-D. That's the way it was spelled in the King's English, Lord. <laughs> so consequently, when I see, you know, I'm serious. This is why Christ is a Christos, is oil. Well, congealed oil is the Lord, Lord. But uh, the, high, uh, the idea of an avatar or a teacher has been with us for thousands of years, and it's true. Every time the world is heading into darkness, it seems like God or the divine presence in the universe moves certain people in their heart to stand up against the darkness and help their fellow man, like the scripture says, you know, just carry even one candle will light a darkened world. So I believe that there is something to this idea that God raises up individuals to enlighten his fellow man at, you know, in dark periods of history. Could I ask you one other question about astral theology? <clears throat> Have you looked into the Mayan calendar? What do you think about that? Well, I think the Mayans and the Aztecs and the Incas and the Toltec and all of those ancient people, I think South America and Central America is just crammed, filled with interesting ancient stuff. And we, we, we tend to feel that the Egyptians and the people from that area of Africa and in Europe somehow or another got over here to South America because we still have the same pyramids and the same uh, symbolism. We find the same symbolism in Central and South America we find in, in, in uh, the Middle East. And so obviously they, they came from the Middle East and, uh, and Egypt and Africa across to, uh, to South and Central America. I'm saying, uh-uh, maybe not. Maybe it started in Central America and South America and went to that way. Why, why do you, and I am totally convinced in my own mind <clears throat> that the most ancient cultures on the face of the earth, as in South America and Central America, probably 100,000 years old or more in, in Peru and the Brazil and that whole area of the world, I think, is just replete with ancient stuff that far, far exceeds anything Egypt ever did. <clears throat> so. I'm seeing that there's a whole world of, uh, of questions that we've never been allowed to ask. I think that Central and South America is the epitome of ancient civilizations. I don't even know, uh, I don't think that the ancient Mayas and the Aztecs and those people, those are the ones we know of. I think that there were some very old ones like uh, Earth Base One. Earth Base One is in the Andes, it's as high up in the Andes as you can get. And it is a profoundly, it's so high up that people going there today can hardly breathe. Even mountain climbers say it's very difficult to breathe. It's, it's so far, so high up. And yet, the stones are like 100 tons, 300 ton stones, and they're all cut flawlessly and pieced together. And I'm saying, wait a minute, who moves 200 ton stones? and air that even the best mountain climbers can hardly catch your breath. And there's no way to plant food up there. You don't plant anything up at that, at that height. So how did these people feed themselves and move two and three hundred ton stones? And not one from all over. They're just huge uh, temples built with these stones. And I'm saying somebody better start looking at this. I'll tell you what I think really happened. I think that we are a creation of someone else. I think that's what happened. I think somebody came here a long time ago and created us. And they're still with us. Where is Earth Base One that you refer to? It's, it's um, I'm not sure. I think it's Ecuador, but I'm not sure. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you where you can find it. Why don't you just look for it? It's just call Earth Base One. You can look for it in reference works. And on the, on the web, they got a lot of material on Earth Base One. They call it Earth Base One because it's, it seems to be the oldest city on the Earth. Incidentally, they say Jericho was the oldest city. No, 
Jericho is not the oldest city in the world, heaven. <clears throat> Earth Base One, now that's old. You know the story about the walls come tumbling down from Jericho? There's only one problem with that story. Jericho never had any walls. <laughs>